Let me very briefly introduce our speaker today, Alpai Pasupati. He got his PhD from the group of Dan Ralph at Cornell in 2004, studying electron transport in molecular transistors. Uh, after that, he, he changed fields a little bit and joined the group of Ali Asdani at Princeton for a postdoctoral fellowship uh, from 2004 to 2008. And since then, since 2009, Alpai Pasupati has been a professor of physics at the Columbia University. And then also since 2019, he's also a group leader in the Condensed Matter Physics and Material Science Department at Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, his group is known for carrying, uh, carrying out experiments on quantum materials, especially focusing on materials with strong correlations. And there have been several breakthrough uh, nice results in the last years, for example, on twisted two-dimensional materials, so graphene and also TMD, twisted DMD structures. And as you all probably know, the, the main experimental tool is scanning kind of probe microscopy, but they of course are also experts in sample fabrication and also do some, some transport measurements. And the talk today, the title is Quantum Phenomena at 2D Interfaces. And with that, uh, we look forward to your talk very much, so please, the floor is yours. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Peter, for the kind introduction. I assume you can hear me. I have minimized the window of all the people, so I cannot see anybody. So if you have a question or so, then just either shout or uh, put it in the chat. Okay, so I wasn't quite sure what the audience is going to be, but I saw that this thing was titled Atomic Scale. I forget what the full title is. So I assume that that means that there's a lot of people who do STM here. And so my talk is indeed going to be all about STM. And I want to talk about two recent works from uh, my group in collaboration with others. Uh, one of them is on the archive and hopefully will be published soon. And the other one was just came out. So I thought this would be a nice opportunity to talk about this uh, work as well. And here is sort of a list of all the people who are involved in both of these works. Um, I should especially acknowledge uh, Carmen, who was a postdoc in my lab, just left my lab and is now back in Europe, and uh, Simon, who is a grad student um, in my group. All right. Um, so let me get going, if this will go. OK, here we go. So in the first part of the talk, I want to talk about uh, this material twisted trilayer graphene, which is new, but it's all of you know two years old, which in this business is kind of infinitely old. Um, and I want to try to give you a sense of what's interesting about the atomic and electronic structure of this material. And to give you some context, Let's start with uh, uh, the famous McDonald and Bistritzer continuum model of twisted bilayer graphene. So what McDonald and Bistritzer did in 2011, and I believe this was inspired by experimental work by Eva Andre and, and collaborators, um, is to consider what happens when you have two sheets of graphene and uh, ask what the electronic structure of these two sheets are when there's a twist angle between them. And as I assume most of you know, um, there's two primary effects that happen. One is that when you have a twist angle, there is a super lattice in the system. And the super lattice means that there's going to be band gaps formed uh, in the electronic structure. And the location of those band gaps in, in momentum is the inverse of the real space wavelength. And the size of these band gaps is proportional to the strength of that periodic potential. And that's what we learn in solid state physics. However, there's a second very important effect which is that electrons can hop between the two layers. And when you correctly take into account the fact that the electrons in the two layers can, can hybridize with each other, you get this so-called magic condition at the right angle where um, one of the bands is essentially perfectly flat uh, within this model. And um, so they, they wrote down a very beautiful and it's fairly simple, you know, when I teach solid state physics, I give this as one of the problems for my solid state physics class. And it's something that students can do and, and, and understand. And in this model, there are of course, some approximations made of the real system. Um, for example, if I put two sheets of graphene on top of each other, then those sheets are not going to form perfectly flat rigid structures. They're going to buckle a little bit. 
And in the original model, this kind of buckling was neglected. There might also be lateral strain inside this, and that was also neglected in this original model. And since the original model, there have been many um, further works by many authors who have tried to include these effects at some level to get a more realistic picture of what the electronic structure of twisted bilayographene is, for example. Um, just to advertise a little bit, you know, work from my group, uh, but also other people who have seen these kinds of effects. Um, the lattice um, reconstruction is something that becomes especially severe when the angle is fairly small. So when the angle between the two lattices is very small, then instead of having a continuously varying structure, um, what happens is that the material instead prefers to form uh, domains where the structure is is commensurate. So this is so-called Bernal graphene. And then the little regions where you have to break that Bernal uh, order in order to get the overall twist angle correct. And uh, we saw this a few years ago. And even before us, people have seen this in graphene and graphite indeed for a very, very long time. Um, the other issue, the issue of strain within the unit cell is also something that we considered last year. This was in the context not of graphene, but the transition metal dichalcogenides. Um, there, when you go to certain Moray wavelengths, the structure of the unit cell can become quite different from what you, know, you would naively think just based upon geometry. And this indeed has a profound effect on the electronic structure of the material. So, so these kinds of things are things that we and many other groups are, are studying. Uh, however, in uh, what I would say is that, you know, in spite of all of these differences between real materials and the continuum model, the continuum model of twisted bilayer graphene is still an extremely successful model. And many of the um, things that, that the model tells us, for example, the model can tell us about what the wave functions of, of the electrons look like. And that helps us understand, for example, why one could have a quantum anomalous Hall effect in, in this system. Um, uh, even when we try to include the effect of electron correlations, which is not included in the original model, usually we start from the continuum model and then we put in correlations and ask how does that change the, the, the model in some way. And uh, so what I would say is that this continuum model has given us a very good basis for understanding all of the various physical phenomena that are observed in twisted bilayer graphene. And it's kind of a starting point and very successful starting point. So in um, the more recent years, so this is starting, I believe, in 2019, uh, there was a natural question to ask what happens if I go beyond twisted bilayer graphene to other more complex systems, which can have trilayer, four layers, how many other layers you want. And uh, there was a, a beautiful set of theory work, both from the group of Alan McDonald, as well as uh, Ashwin Vishwanath and co-workers, and where they considered this particular system, which is a system that I'm going to talk about. This is twisted trilayer graphene. And in the theorist's conception of twisted trilayer graphene, uh, you have three layers. You have a top layer and a bottom layer. And it's assumed that this top layer and bottom layer are perfectly aligned with each other. And this middle layer is twisted relative to both of these layers. So relative to the top layer, it's twisted by some angle theta. And relative to the bottom layer, it's twisted by some angle minus theta. And what was shown was that for this system as well, if you work out the continuum model, the appropriate continuum model, indeed, you will find that there is a magic angle in the system. And the magic angle in the system is around 1.5 degrees. So for twisted bilayer graphene, it's 1.1 degrees. For, for this one, it's around 1.5 degrees. And uh, not only that, in, in the theoretical work, it was also asked what would happen if I have not three layers, but four or five or more. And a whole sequence of magic angles has now been predicted for many different layers. And, and all of this has been worked out within the continuum model. Um, just to show you uh, one of the recent works from Alan McDonald's group, this, for example, this red curve here tells you what the density of states is for twisted trilayer graphene at zero displacement field. So the prediction is indeed that there's a flat band, there's a big peak in the density of states, and this big peak in the density of states should be at the Fermi level at charge neutrality and with zero displacement field. 
And uh, it didn't take long for um, people doing transport to verify that something very interesting happened in, in this system as well. And what was found was that this system as well goes superconducting, um, like twisted bilayer graphene. However, there are some differences, at least as of now, there are some differences between superconductivity in twisted trilayer graphene and twisted bilayer graphene. The recent work from twisted bilayer graphene basically shows that superconductivity exists pretty much at most places of the phase diagram. And by phase diagram, I mean the doping dependent phase diagram. So if you dope the system, you'll observe superconductivity at many different places, except for at maybe exactly integer filling where there can be insulating states. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at superconductivity in twisted trilayer graphene, all of the work so far have shown that this superconductivity exists in some fairly narrow range of doping. And this narrow range of doping is somewhere between half filling, which is minus two here, and full filling, which is, which is minus four. So it's somewhere between uh, two and four. Um, this is, I forget if this is the experiment by Philip or by Pablo. I think this is Pablo's experiment, but Philip Kim's data also is very similar. So one uh, question is, why is this the case? Now, other differences in twisted trilayer graphene, there has been some evidence, this is from, from Pablo Harillo Herrera's group, that if you apply a magnetic field, then you see something that looks like re-entrance superconductivity. So superconductivity first dies away with the parallel magnetic field and then reappears at, at high magnetic field. And if that's indeed the case, that would imply that there's some unusual spin structure of the Cooper pair. So perhaps a spin triplet state or something really interesting of that type. Um, even more recently, now um, people have taken this to the next step and gone from tri-layer to four-layer to five-layer, and it has been seen that all of these things, tri-layer, quad-layer, and five-layer, are all superconducting, and their TCs are roughly comparable, not off by a huge amount from each other. Quite interestingly, so this is work from Pablo's group, this is work from Stefan Naj Perge's group, if you look at... Uh, where superconductivity is observed, it's once again observed in this range just past half filling. So it's between two and three. Here it kind of leaks across two. In this experiment, it looks to be on this side of two. Uh, but anyway, it looks fairly similar to twisted trilayer graphene and looks quite different from twisted bilayer graphene, at least as of now. And I should say that, you know, these are early days in the sense that you can see that these papers are from just a couple of months ago. And so the experimental system might indeed change as the samples get better. Now, let's ask a little bit about the reality of the sample. So um, here, this, this, this is work from Philip Kim, where they did the following very clever measurement. What they did is they took a twisted trilayer and they made regions of the sample where there's the entire trilayer, that's this region. And then they cut up the sample in such a way that there's a region of the sample where there's only the top and middle layer. So there's a twisted bilayer. And here there's a region of the sample where there's only the middle and the bottom layer. And so both of these form twisted bilayers. And by looking at transport, they could tell what the average angle is in this region, what the average angle is in this region. And uh, they find that the middle and bottom one is at 1.3 degrees. The top and middle one is at 1.7 degrees. And there's a claim in this paper, um, you know, with some evidence in the sense that transport doesn't show evidence for multiple angles in the sample. Uh, but I would say not super clear evidence that in this region where you have the twisted trilayer that they lock into this 1.5 degree uh, orientation. Um, and, and as far as I can tell, this is the only transport paper where they've really looked at this issue of what is the real structure of this twisted trilayer where superconductivity is seen. And why is this important? This is important because the way the samples are made is not the theorist conception that the top and bottom layers are perfectly aligned to each other. These layers are picked up sequentially according to the recipe that was taught to us by Emmanuel Tutok and his group. And they are placed on top of each other and so if you're an experimentalist, you would be dubious whether the top layer and the bottom layer can ever be perfectly aligned. 
right? Of course, there should be some force that wants them to line up with each other. But we know from previous studies on these systems that these systems are very delicate and it's very easy to go away from that condition of perfect stacking between two layers. And so our question when we started to do STM on this was how much is this a reality in a sample that one makes? Uh, how much are they really like the theorist conception? And if they are not like the theorist conception, does this have an effect on the electronic structure? And again, in the case of twisted bilayer graphene, the answer is, well, they're not exactly like the theorist conception, but the differences are not super important to the physics of the material. They, sure, there can be some strain, sure, there can be some heterogeneity, et cetera, but still the continuum model and that way of thinking is a very good way of thinking of, of the system. So the question is, is that the same in this material? Okay, so in order to explain the STM data to you, I have to first lead you through uh, the question, uh, the following question. Let's say I take three layers of graphene and I place the first layer and the second layer at some angle with respect to each other. And then I place the third layer on top and the third layer in general is not perfectly aligned with the first layer, but it might have a small misalignment. What do we expect for the atomic structure of such a material? Okay, so let's start with a single sheet of graphene. And I'm illustrating this as a triangular lattice rather than a honeycomb lattice, just for simplicity. So this is a triangular symmetry of one sheet of graphene. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a second sheet of graphene on top of it in PowerPoint. And if we do this, then we know what the result is. We know this for uh, quite some time, that there are going to be regions where the carbon atoms are sitting on top of each other. These are the so-called AA regions uh, of the Moray lattice. And there are going to be regions where the carbon atoms are perfectly offset from each other. Those are the Bernal or AB regions. So if I zoom out now from this picture and I look at it, what I have is I have now a triangular lattice and this triangular lattice is a lattice of AA points of the Moray lattice, okay? So let me now abstract this picture. And instead of showing you all the atoms, I'll show you only the AA points. So those are the AA points of the Moray lattice. And let me throw out all the atoms. So now I have a Moray lattice. So this looks of course, exactly like a triangular lattice, but this is now not a triangular lattice of atoms. This is a triangular lattice of Moray lattice points. Now, I have, let me now come to a twisted trilayer graphene. So I have a moray between the top and the middle layer. And I also have a moray between the middle and the top layer. And in general, if the top and bottom layers are not perfectly aligned with each other, this means that these two morays between the bottom and middle and between the middle and the top are not exactly the same. So they're off by each other from a small amount. And so let me show you what that would look like. So let me now show you two different Moray patterns. And uh, so I have now a complicated situation where I have two different Moray patterns that are existing in the system. And this looks in a certain sense, somewhat like the Moray of atoms, but now this is a Moray of Morays, okay? And so there are going to be regions of this Moray of Morays where the carbon atoms are lined up in all three lattices. This we call the A, A tilde A region of the sample. So this is where I have A, A, A stacking roughly in all three layers. And um, then there are going to be regions where the two morays are offset from each other. And those regions we call the A, A tilde B, meaning that one of the layers, it looks like Bernal arrangement or B, A tilde A uh, is the equivalent one. Okay, so now let me zoom out and let me make a picture of what this sample would look like from a very large length scale. If I look at a very large length scale, what I expect to see if these two morays exist is that there are going to be regions of the sample where there's A, A tilde A sample, uh, A, A tilde A stacking, where if I look down at the atomic scale, I have something that looks like all three honeycombs are sitting on top of each other. And there are going to be other regions which look like A, A tilde B stacking, where one of the two layers is Bernal stacked with respect to the middle layer, while the other layer is A, A stacked. And so you get all these kinds of stacking arrangements. And so this is a really complicated uh, scenario in general, if I have three arbitrary angles between the, the three lattices. Now, 
if you go through the arguments carefully, it turns out that there are actually two different types of stacking arrangements. And these two different types of stacking arrangements differ in a slip by one lattice constant of the top layer. There is this so-called A, A tilde A stacking, where I have regions of looking down at the sample. I have A, 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 B, A, B, and A, B, A stacking. And if I shift the top layer by uh, one half of a lattice constant, I will get a completely different kind of stacking order, which is A, B, 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 A, C, which is so-called rhombohedral graphene and A, A, B. Right? And if you haven't worked this through, it will take you a little bit of time to figure this out. But if you sit down with a pen and pencil, you'll realize that this is indeed the case. And so the first question was, which of these stacking arrangements do we have in our samples? And it turns out that these two stacking arrangements have very, very different electronic properties in general. Right? And so the question is, when you make a general sample, which, which of these stackings do we have? Um, and from theory, it was predicted that this particular stacking, the A, A tilde A stacking is the more uh, stable one, but the stability of this is not very high in the sense that in, in general, we don't expect there to be a big barrier between going from this stacking to the other stacking. Okay, so with all of that said, let me now show you STM data for this particular sample. And so what I'm showing you here is the atomic structure of twisted trilayer graphene. And uh, what you're seeing here are not individual atoms. What you're seeing are the, is the Moray lattice. So this length scale is very large. The scale bars here are 50 nanometers. And so this is a very large length scale. And what I hope you see very, very clearly is the presence of two different wavelengths in this sample. So you can see that there's an average spacing between nearest neighbors here. That defines one length scale, one Moray lattice scale. And you can also see a second Moray lattice, which is going from here to here. And that Moray lattice is much, much larger than the first Moray lattice. And, and what you can do is you can take these two Moray lattice scales and you can figure out what the angles are between the top layer and the middle layer and between the middle layer and the bottom layer is from these two um, uh, lattice constants. And for this particular area of the sample, the, the angle between the top and middle is 1.7, area between the middle and the bottom is 1.4. And as it turns out, this is almost precisely the numbers that are quoted by Philip Kim um, for a sample that is superconducting. Now, I should say that so far in our experiments, uh, we have not measured superconductivity directly. That's because we just haven't gone cold enough in, in our experiments, but that's something that we're working on right now. So all the statements that I make about superconductivity from now on are all statements that are um, based upon the normal state electronic structure that we measure. And we don't directly measure superconducting gaps in our experiment just yet. OK, so um, what's going on here? What you can see is that there's a region where the Moray lattice is fairly uniform. So you can see here that there's a lattice that's fairly uniform. And then you can see all of a sudden there's, there looks like something where it, the lattice more lattice constant is off by quite a lot. You can see it on this figure much better. You can see in the interior of this, let me call this a grain, the Moray lattice is fairly well defined. And then here the Moray lattice suddenly slips and has some funky behavior. And in order to explain this to you, uh, let me make an analogy with what we call the linear soliton in these materials. So imagine I take two sheets and I place them on top of each other. And there is a small difference in the lattice constant of the two sheets with respect to each other. Then what will happen is in order to save on uh, the van der Waals energy, the lattice can often do the following thing. The lattice will line up in most regions of the sample. And in a particular region, which we call a soliton, one of the atoms or a few of the atoms will pop up and will be not commensurate with the lattice that's below. And so if you study such a sample, what you'll find is that there are regions of commensurate order where the two lattices are perfectly in registry with each other. And these two regions are separated by solitons. And, and we've studied this and many other people have studied this in the linear case. So this is when two lattices are stretched with respect to each other by a small amount. 
So what we are seeing here is not a linear soliton, but what we're seeing is a rotational soliton in, in that sense. So we have two moray patterns which are off from each other by a small amount. And so what the system does is it forms regions where the three lattices do form the ideal stacking order that's predicted by theorists, but it cannot do this everywhere in the sample. It has to pay the cost for doing this. And the way it pays, pays the cost for doing this is that there are very localized regions where the twist angle is quite different from the interior of this grain. And we call these objects twistons, just in analogy with the linear soliton. And so what you have at the end of the day is a network of these twistons. There's a, a triangular lattice of these twistons. And these twistons are connected by domain walls, which are twist domain walls, where there's a shearing uh, between the two lattices. So with this in mind, we can then go in and actually quantify the twist angles at every point in space. Remember that the Moray lattice constant tells you about what the local twist angle is. So the lattice constant is related to the wavelength of the Moray in real space. And so I can simply go into every point and I can measure the distance of the six nearest neighbors and I can average that and I can tell you what the average Moray lattice constant is at every point in space. I can then convert that to a twist angle, a local twist angle, and I can make a map of the local twist angle in such a sample. And so if you do that, this is the sort of picture that you get. Indeed, you get uh, a picture where there's a region of the sample on the interior of this grain where the twist angle is actually fairly close to the so-called magic angle. It's around 1.5 degrees. But then as I go to these special points, these twist on points, the twist angle is actually uh, quite a lot higher. It's close to two degrees in this region. And so you have a lattice of these twist tones, which are then separating these regions of what we call magic mode. Very good. So this is the picture that emerges for the atomic scale structure. Um, and so now the question is, how does this influence the electronic structure of the material? And so the first thing we did is we went to one of the uniform regions. We went to one of these regions where the stacking order is fairly uniform and it's very close to this magic angle. So it's around 1.55 degrees, which is almost exactly this magic angle. And we happened to find a region which was the largest we could find. It's a couple of hundred nanometers of very uniform stacking. And so we go in there with our STM tip and you can sit at any given location and do spectroscopy and try to understand the spectroscopy in the context of the continuum model. So if you do this, what you find is that indeed the, the broad picture of what you see in spectroscopy matches to some extent with what the continuum model says. So here, for example, is uh, the blue here is the experimentally measured spectrum at an angle of 1.55 degrees. The, this is for a smaller angle of 1.08 degrees. And on the right here, these are um, calculations from the continuum model for 1.55 degrees and uh, 1.08 degrees. And uh, the only thing that we have to fudge in the continuum model is we have to choose the Fermi velocity of graphene to be 1.3 times the bare velocity that you get. And this is sort of a well-known effect in, in graphene. So um, anyway, so we did this measurement and what we see is that we see there's a peak in the density of states. And if you look closely, you can see that this peak actually has two peaks in it. And then these two peaks are separated by about 20 milli electron volts. And uh, you can, by fixing the theory, by uh, increasing the in-plane hopping, you can sort of get the uh, spacing between these peaks to match between theory and experiment. But the widths of these peaks that are measured in experiment completely do not match what the continuum model predicts. The continuum model says that the width should be on the order of a millivolt, but in experiment, it's measured to be around 15 millivolts, so much larger. And so one question is, can the width of these peaks be related to correlations? And so um, uh, the short answer is yes. And we worked with our theory friends to do a more realistic Hartree-Fock calculation. And it, you can start to go in the right direction. I wouldn't say that you get exactly the right numbers, but you can start to get in the right direction of reproducing the widths of these peaks. 
You can also look at the doping dependence of the spectra. So shown here are a sequence of doping dependent spectra for different values of the doping. And what you see is that as you apply doping, you see that these two peaks start to become distinct. They start to split from each other. And one of these peaks starts to become more strong. So in this case, the valence band becomes strong at negative filling. And here the conduction band starts to become strong at uh, uh, positive filling. And uh, I would say that these things, again, there's some broad agreements with the continuum model, but if you look at the details, the details don't exactly match. And let me not, uh, since I am at 9.30 already, let me not get too much into the hung up into the details of all of this and say that there's, there's some similarities between what the continuum model predicts, but the main thing that the continuum model does not quite get right is that the widths of these peaks are, are not what the continuum model predicts and the separation between the peaks also is not properly captured the doping dependence of the separation between these peaks okay so now one of the reasons we did this experiment is to ask from this electronic structure so from this normal state electronic structure can i say something about why superconductivity should exist between mu equals minus two and minus three. So this is where superconductivity is observed and superconductivity is observed also here, but superconductivity is not observed um, at charge neutrality, for example. And uh, the short answer of this, and again, I don't want to get into too much detail is that no. So if I just look at the band structure and I look at the doping evolution of the band structure, then one reason why you can have superconductivity occur is because there's a big peak in the density of states. So when the density of states is large, that's good for superconductivity. And at least in twisted bilayer graphene, that's certainly the region where superconductivity is observed. So when you start doping twisted bilayer graphene, you go into one of the Van Hove singularities, the density of state starts to become high and voila, you get superconductivity. In this material, on the other hand, the regions where you see superconductivity don't appear to be very well correlated with where the normal state density of states is high. Um, in some places like here where superconductivity is observed, indeed the density of states is high, but here when superconductivity is observed, it's not at a peak of the density of states, it's somewhere between two peaks of the density of states. And so the net conclusion from all of this is that if you just look at this uniform region of the moray, I cannot tell you why superconductivity should only exist between nu equals two and nu equals three. Well, so then we ask the second question, let me now look at the electronic structure of the sample, not at the level of one of these individual grains, but let me look at the overall electronic structure of the sample. Can I say something about the overall electronic structure of the sample, including not only these regions of uniform stacking, but also these regions of, of twist stars? And then we saw something quite amazing which is that if you measure the spectrum on these twist ons, the spectrum on these twist ons is quite completely different from the spectrum within this uniform region. Perhaps it's not completely amazing. It's the structure is quite different on this twist on region. So here, for example, is a sequence of spectra taken at different regions of this moray. This dark blue curve here is a curve that's taken in this uniform region. This fits what the continuum model says that there should be a peak in the density of states at the Fermi level of charge neutrality. On the other hand, if I look at the twist on where, where, this, where uh, it's, its twist angle is different, there I see two peaks in the density of states and these two peaks are quite well separated from each other. So it's very, very different from this um, uniform region. Something very amusing, which I don't quite understand, is that if you look at the electronic structure of this twist on and you compare it to the uh, continuum model for two degrees, which is what we calculate the twist angle of the twist on to be, there's actually a pretty good match. And uh, that kind of, maybe it's just a coincidence because this continuum model is after all based on a case space description. And this twist on is exactly one unit cell in size. So I don't quite understand why there should be any match between experiment and theory, but quite interestingly, there is a match between experiment and theory. Uh, for what the electronic structure of the twist on should be as well. Okay, so um, this is to tell you that the electronic structure of this sample is quite inhomogeneous in space. And now let me ask the following question. 
if I sit at different values of doping and I measure the density of states at the Fermi level. So remember the density of states at the Fermi level is the most important thing for superconductivity. I ask myself what the density of states at the Fermi level looks like across the entire sample. We see something quite amazing. So this is a charge neutrality. So if you look at charge neutrality at the Fermi level and you measure the local density of states in all of space, you see what looks like almost a network of grains. So there are regions of high density of states. So these are the regions of high density of states that are well separated by these regions of low density of states. And you know, going back to what our spectra show, that's because at the twist on sites, at charge neutrality, there's actually a, a, a dip in the density of states, a pronounced dip in the density of states. And so overall, this looks like a very granular material at charge neutrality. Now, if I start to dope the system, there is an additional complication, which is caused by the fact that the uniform region and the twist on region actually have slightly different twist angles. And if they have different twist angles, they're going to dope at different rates. And so what this means is that the number of electrons required to fill that unit cell completely uh, in real numbers is different for the uniform region and for the twist on region. And what's the implication of this? The implication of this is as I start to dope the system, since they're doping at different rates, there will be some particular doping for which the peaks in the density of states actually line up with each other in the twist on region and in the uniform moray region. And as it turns out, this lining of the peaks, this is the place where the peaks in, on average line up across the sample, happens to occur exactly between nu equals two and nu equals three, where superconductivity is seen in this sample. And you can see the same effect if you measure the local density of states. When you measure the local density of states at charge neutrality, you see these regions of high density of states that are well separated by regions of low density of states. But when I go to this region between nu equals two and three, either plus or minus, this granularity sort of disappears and the system becomes more homogeneous. Okay? So again, I want to emphasize that we're not directly measuring superconductivity in this experiment, but one intriguing possibility is that this system is actually in some sense a granular system and the granularity of the system is actually minimized in the region where superconductivity is seen in transport experiments. And you know, regardless of whether this fact is true or not, I think this requires more experiments to conclusively show. What this says is that in any real sample of twisted trilayer, and therefore twisted quad layer and twisted five layer and so on, the electronic structure of these materials is somehow fundamentally different from twisted bilayer graphene. In twisted bilayer graphene, when I have disorder, then the disorder is a small correction to the electronic structure that's predicted by the continuum model. In these materials, when I have disorder, disorder completely messes up the electronic structure of the material. However, I do think it's also an opportunity for us to design, for example, scattering centers in these materials that can scatter electrons in particular ways, or to find ways by which you can control superconductivity by using this kind of patterning. So I think it's a very interesting opportunity. So let me see how I'm doing in terms of time. I am uh, 40 minutes in, so uh, very good. So let me perhaps spend five minutes on this, this next topic, maybe 10 minutes if, you, if you'll allow me, and then I'll conclude. Yeah, so, 10 is no problem. <laughs> okay, very good. So this second uh, work is a work that just came out in, in Nature Physics earlier this year. And this is a work on studying pneumatic behavior in twisted double bilayer graphene. Um, so, you know, a lot of you perhaps are also studying these kinds of Moray systems or have certainly seen a lot about these Moray systems. And one can ask what's so great about these Moray systems when after all, there are many systems which have shown mod insulator behavior or superconductivity in more traditional correlated materials and the energy scales and temperature scales are much more impressive than anything we can do in these Moray systems. In, in my mind, what's really nice about these Moray systems is that you have these tuning knobs uh, where you can apply electric voltages and you can tune through doping or you can tune through displacement field in these systems without actually changing the sample. So essentially in one sample, you can study a phase diagram 
which is something that's usually you cannot do. There are a few knobs like pressure, which you can do these sorts of experiments, but the typical doping uh, dependence that you do in a correlated material is you make a bunch of samples and each sample is different, has its own disorder and so on and so forth. And in this context, if you now go back to your traditional correlated materials and ask yourself, what's really the interesting stuff in these things? The interesting stuff is not so much the fact that there's some Mott insulator in these materials. You know, we know a lot about Mott insulators. In some sense, the Mott insulating state by itself is a rather boring state. But the really interesting and theoretically and experimentally challenging region is what happens when you dope away from this Mott insulator. So this is the famous cuprate phase diagram. When you go away from the antiferromagnetic insulator, and you start to dope, that's when you see superconductivity. Not only superconductivity, you see various density waves, you see um, you know, strange metal behavior and all these sorts of other interesting phenomena. Um, but these phenomena are often not easy to measure. Superconductivity is, is fairly easy to measure because you can see in transport zero resistance. But if I have a charge density wave or a spin density wave, it's not very easy to measure in a transport measurement. And so a lot of work in the past 20 years in the cube rates has gone into understanding these kinds of phenomena with, with you know, state-of-the-art tools and lots of tools have been developed, including STM, to, to measure these kinds of properties. And so one natural question in these moray materials is to ask, apart from you know, insulating behavior um, and apart even from superconducting behavior, are there other interesting quantum states which perhaps don't show up very easily in transport measurements um, that we can see in STM. And uh, in this respect, it's it's been an interest of mine and for many people to study spontaneous breaking of rotational symmetry. And uh, these systems are actually a very good candidate to observe this kind of order for a very simple reason. So here's a picture of the Moray lattice. And we can think of the Moray lattice as basically a triangular lattice. And if you wish to think about it in an orbital description, think of it as, you know, there's, there's orbitals which have the rotational symmetry of this, of this Moray lattice. And what we can do is we can tune density in, in this material. So we can fill these, if you think of three orbitals, you can fill these three orbitals with either zero, one, two, three, four, five, or six electrons. Um, and in multi-orbital systems like this, it's very common that if I have a system that's where the three orbitals are originally degenerate, then this degeneracy can be split spontaneously. So uh, two of the orbitals or one of the orbitals can go down in energy, the other orbital can go up in energy. And if the filling is just right, then you end up saving energy by doing this. Right? And so this is um, a pneumatic state, a state that breaks the discrete rotational symmetry of the lattice. And the caveat to all of this is that in these Moray systems, these kinds of orbital descriptions are highly non-trivial. And sometimes when you have topological states, you know, it's, it's, it's problematic to even make these kinds of orbital descriptions. But regardless, just from a sort of intuitive sense of view, one does expect that in these kinds of materials that there should be these pneumatic phases because of the our ability to dope them as well as these, this uh, high degeneracy that one has. And uh, uh, just one slide to say that in other materials like the iron nictides, the way this kind of pneumatic behavior is seen, there have been you know, long-standing questions about what's the relationship of this pneumatic behavior and other uh, phenomena seen in these materials like superconductivity or, or interesting metallic behavior, and also what drives this kind of pneumatic behavior in these materials. So we decided to look for this kind of um, pneumatic behavior. The first time we saw some evidence for this was in twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, we and also other groups saw evidence for the fact that C3 rotational symmetry is broken in this material. Now, in twisted bilayer graphene, the samples turn out to be not too particularly uniform. And so it's always a difficult thing when you have a sample that doesn't have C3 rotational symmetry, then of course, all the electronic states also inherit this breaking of C3 rotational symmetry. And we made arguments and other people have made arguments that there's an electronic mechanism for this C3 rotational symmetry breaking 
but it was still a difficult thing to do because the sample intrinsically doesn't have this rotational symmetry. So um, we then switched to twisted double bilayer graphene, which turns out that you can make more uniform samples, at least the samples that we could get from, that we could make or have from our collaborators were much more uniform than twisted bilayer graphene. And just one second on the phenomenology of twisted double bilayer graphene. Twisted double bilayer graphene also has an insulating state. Um, I don't think superconductivity has been confirmed in this system, but certainly there's an insulating state at half filling. And in this material, it happens when you apply also an electric field. So at zero electric field, this material is not an insulator. When you apply an electric field, it does become an insulator. And in our experiments, we stay away from this insulating state. So we tune doping and also electric field, and we go along this line, but we are at no point are we entering this insulating phase. Instead, we are looking in the metallic regions of the sample and asking, is there any evidence for rotational symmetry breaking? And so here's a picture of the topography of our sample. And we were able to get really beautiful and over large area microns uh, of the sample, very, very uniform samples where the Moray lattice has C3 rotational symmetry. And so, for example, if you take this region and you calculate the average twist angle, it's 1.05 degrees, and the bound on this is plus or minus 0.02, and that's essentially the error of our STM. And so the strain that we have in this region is essentially zero within the error bars of our experiment. And so what we wanted to ask is, if I look at this and I change the doping in the system, is there ever a point when the rotational symmetry of the electronic wave functions is broken? And so I want to show you that indeed uh, this does happen in the system. So the way we do this is by doing our usual STM spectroscopy and mapping the local density of states. So first to show you what the electronic structure of this material looks like. This material also has flat bands like twisted bilayer and twisted trilayer graphene. And uh, you can see that the flat bands give you a peak in the density of states at low energy. And uh, this peak is mostly concentrated on one particular lattice site, the so-called ABAB lattice site. Now, what you can do is, uh, let me just jump this, skip through this, and you can, pick different energies and you can map the local density of states in real space. And you can ask yourself, what's the symmetry of these wave functions? Do they have threefold rotational symmetry? And so what I'm showing you here are a sequence of uh, images of the local density of states taken at different energies, both outside the flat bands, and I'll show you also inside the flat bands. And importantly, all these measurements are done at charge neutrality. So. Um, for a particular value of doping, which is charge neutrality in the, in the system. And if you do this, you see beautiful patterns that emerge for the wave functions. And uh, uh, you, you see that they have these intricate structures. And what I want you to notice is not any of the fine details of this, but to notice that the basic threefold rotational symmetry of the lattice is preserved for all of these wave functions whether you're looking within the flat bands or whether you're looking outside the flat bands, all of them have this rotational symmetry. And uh, from some hard work from our theoretical colleagues, they were actually able to match even the shapes of these wave functions reasonably well between theory and experiment. This took actually quite a lot of work by uh, our, our theory colleagues to make this happen. Okay, so this was all shown to you at a value of zero doping. Now, what we can do is we can change the doping and the magic of the system again is you just apply a gate voltage and you change the doping and you do the same measurement again. And so what I want to show you is now a different doping. And in order to see that there's a different doping, you'll see that there's a shift of these bands. So now you are located in the conduction flat band. And uh, on the top here is the set of data seen in uh, zero doping, which shows the threefold rotational symmetry. And on the bottom here, I want to show you that there's a particular energy, and this energy happens in the valence flat band, where you can see that this threefold rotational symmetry is completely broken, and you see these stripe-like features emerge. And so this is really wonderful because within a single sample, you can see uh, particular values of doping where threefold rotational symmetry is present, and other values of doping where the threefold rotational symmetry is gone. And so this gives us great confidence that this is some intrinsic electronic phenomenon of the sample. 
Now showing you over a much larger region of the sample, this is at charge neutrality, and this is away from charge neutrality, you can clearly see the difference. You can see the nice triangular lattice here, and you see the stripe-like behavior here. And you can also analyze this in Fourier space if you want by looking at the Fourier transform and really show that this is a pneumatic phase. This is a phase where one of the directions of the lattice is preferred by the electrons in comparison to the other two. And since I'm uh, running short on time, let me skip one important, interesting part of the story. We had theoretical colleagues ask whether this pneumatic phase um, arises from a breaking of symmetry at the atomic scale or the Morel lattice scale. And the net conclusion is that this breaking of symmetry happens at the Morel lattice scale. And so in that sense, we might expect this phenomenon to be fairly ubiquitous in other Moray systems as well. So I know I've gone a little late, so let me stop right here and uh, let me take questions that you might have. Thank you. All right. Thank, thanks a lot, very nice talk. So questions. So you can raise hand, shout out or type it in the chat. All work. Can I ask one question? Yeah, sure, go uh, ahead. Up. Okay, um, so back to the tri-layer. And uh, you mentioned at, uh, let's say, um, more uh, twisted um, location, right? You have lower density of states and you have these two peaks um, around the Fermi energy. And then in the, in the middle region, you have higher density of states. So have you checked uh, the gate um, voltage? I mean, if you apply gate, uh, how these, uh, these two peaks, are they closing the gap or do you still have the gap? Yeah, so there is a, um, so thank you for the question. So indeed there's an evolution both in both regions of the sample. Uh, I skipped over that a little bit. Yeah, okay. so, so this is the gate evolution of the spectra in the region, the uniform region, as well as this region, which has this additional twist. Okay. And what, what we see is that in this region of additional twist, there are actually gaps that open up at close to the integer fillings. And this is possibly a correlation effect, although we're not 100% sure. And as far as we know, there's no real theory for this. Um, in, in, in the uniform region, we don't really observe these kinds of gaps open up, uh, correlation driven gaps at least. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's a question in the chat. I can read it out from Sergio Ulo. So can you see individual atoms in the various moires and detect whether the AB sublattice symmetry is broken? Yeah, so indeed you can see individual atoms um, and we don't see any evidence for AB sublattice symmetry breaking. So yeah, so I think that's that's an accurate statement. We did look for that, and as far as we could tell, we could see nothing at the atomic scale that looks like AB sublattice symmetry breaking. Yeah, Fabian. Um, yes, regarding the nematity, um, I think when you were taking the, dim the images of the wave functions, I think there was another energy where I thought there was a quite clear breaking of the threefold symmetry. I think it was called RC1 or something. Maybe you could comment on that. Sure. Um... Exactly, as RC1, you can clearly see that one of the three dots of the triangle is much, has much larger intensity to the other two. Could you comment on this? Do you know what this means? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we quantified where you have more rotational symmetry breaking. Indeed, the most rotational symmetry breaking that we see is in this valence flat band. But there is some amount of symmetry breaking also present and on other uh, other 
energies. So first, I would say that you know that by itself is not surprising because if the system is pneumatic, then in theory, at least at every energy, you should see a difference in the there should be no C3 symmetry. It's a question of magnitude, right? Where at which energies this shows up more prominently. Um, so you know, we could I could go a little bit perhaps and tell you about what theory says. Um, so in theory, you know, we there was a fairly simple model, model at the level of the continuum model, which we were able to reproduce why the primary um, symmetry breaking would be observed in the valence flat band. Right? Um, but indeed, there's small amounts of symmetry breaking that are observed at all energies. So I, I don't think I have anything very profound to say other than, yes, you can see different amounts of symmetry breaking at different energies, but the most prominent one is in the valence flat band. And from a simple theory, we have a good explanation for why that should be the case. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, I think what we could do here is to close the official part. So Abha, if you have a, a few more minutes, you could stay online in case there are some more questions, but we can, we can stop the recording here.